Okay, so afternoon again, everyone, and thank you for joining us back for this afternoon session. So this afternoon, we're going to look at two main areas. We're going to look at some specific climate change projections for Jamaica, and to help us with that would be, well, I will present some stuff, and then our Peter Mandal who was part of the team of persons who worked with the Planning Institute of Jamaica to prepare that state of the state of Jamaica's climate 2019 Nadine. Um, would do would do and would be supported by Nadine. So before we even yes. start, are there any questions that um, you may have anything you'd like to say, any comments, anything, anybody? Nobody? So whilst I'm sharing my screen, you could still go ahead and, and um, indicate if you would like to say anything. So we ended off on this section. Everybody see my screen? Oh, goodness. Um, sorry about that. We ended on the section sort of looking at our ecosystems and we're going on. We have been having a lot of discussion around um, climate change, its impacts on Jamaica. A lot of persons have shared, et cetera, the impacts of climate change on Jamaica. Um, what we want to do just very briefly is to get your take and your sense of the impact on certain sectors. I mean, what are some of the specific impacts we're seeing? And then we'll go into some of the projections for climate change. And in doing this, I want you to begin to think of, you had four groups earlier on and you had you know, five hazards that you felt were the most important hazards that are impacting Jamaica. What are those likely to change if when we filter in or we include the impacts of climate change and we look at some of the projections going forward? So that would be something that we do briefly as well this afternoon. So I think all of us in here have heard of climate change. We know what this, the impacts are. Many of us are feeling the impacts of climate change, if not all of us. We see it, I think, I think never has there been higher anticipation of the hurricane season. Everyone has become a sort of quasi um, internet-based meteorologist. Um, we're all looking at what's gonna happen, where, 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 where the cone is, what it's like, is it going to come to Jamaica? You know, are we prepared? So, I think more, and, and we know that at this time we're seeing, even if it's not affecting Jamaica per se, we're seeing an increase in the intensity and the frequency of these hydrometeorological hazards. I mean, when we think of um, one of the first Cat 5 hurricanes that I was most aware of was Hurricane Mitch, which struck Central America in 1998. But from Hurricane Mitch in 1998, straight back to about 2017, we didn't really hear about much Cat 5 hurricanes. And then in 2017, I mean, when we think about it, 2004 was a watershed year for the Caribbean with Hurricane Ivan. And it was the first time, I think for a long time, for several years, that one tropical cyclone impacted several countries at the same time to the extent that governments, when normally as a Caribbean, we would find governments pooling together to support another country. We were all in the same boat, so, so to speak. I mean, the impact of that was as much as 200% of GDP for countries such as Grenada and the Cayman Islands. So we had that, and then another watershed event kind of year was 2017, 
when within the space of two weeks, we had two cat five events. And then if we look at 2020, and we think of Zeta and IOTA and how they impacted, I believe, Nicaragua, for example, you know, we're seeing an increase in the frequency, but we're seeing the intensity as well. And I, even if we're thinking of 2020 and Zeta and IOTA, we're not even in the regular alphabet. We have moved on and, and, and you know, down that alphabet. So I think generally we understand and we, we're seeing and we're feeling the impacts, even if we're feeling it on behalf of our Caribbean neighbors, other small island states, we see what's coming out of the UN FCCC. We saw what was coming out of COP. Um, I'm sure many of you, if you didn't follow all the discussions or you were not there, you certainly have an idea of what has been emerging out of COP. So, for us in Jamaica, we're seeing, you know, evidence that the climate is changing and climate change is happening. And if we go specifically to say, like, for example, agriculture, what are we seeing with respect to agriculture? Does anyone want to add to that discussion in terms of agriculture? So here we have Increase. agriculture agriculture, tourism, and water resources. And I think we have discussed some of them in some, in some amount of detail in this morning's session. So if anyone wants to add anything as it relates to any of these three sectors and what is happening in these sectors as a result of a changing climate, feel free. Anybody? Nobody wants to add anything on tourism. Please, there is a comment in the chat from Camille. Um, one thing she's noticing is that agriculture lands are being reduced. They're being used more for um, development. Okay, so we do have an insta instances where some of our agricultural lands are being used for things like housing and so on. We do have some of that. Adrian, you are raising your hand. And I know before you even speak, Adrian, I know you're very much involved with beekeeping. And maybe from your experience, maybe you want to share with us if there is any impact on the life expectancy of bees, anything happening with bees with respect to climate change, because so very often we sort of diminish the value of our pollinators and pollination. So I don't know what you were gonna say, Adrian, but I'm asking you to speak about that. I, funny, funny enough, I was going to actually open with an even broader thing to deal with that in terms of um, oftentimes when we speak about um, things like agriculture, we don't talk about mainstreaming biodiversity action right which of which beekeeping is one element it's an agricultural element and when i tell people all the time beekeeping is a forest resource because we collect nectar or or boxes are made from timber which comes from the forest and um the last intervention in the in the, in the chat uh, made mention to um the usage of uh, agricultural lands for housing development uh, and no one really talks about this when, when you displace agricultural lands what happens is that you then go into the forest and you displace forested areas for more agricultural lands but no one tells you that the actual quality of soils and forest isn't conducive to agricultural usage because a lot of the nutrients is locked in the, the the timber resources that we then deforest including for bauxite mining um one of my ancestral my ancestral home in clapham saint anne is actually a victim of that where um we saw most of the forest resources um it's a little it's a little community north of um Monique, 
St. Anne, for those who don't know where Clapham is. But a lot of those agricultural lands were dug up for bauxite mining. There was only six inches of soil that was re-left. We, they, um, I, I don't know who put in um, greenhouses, but they were used for a few years, and then they're now in a state of disrepair. And I'm saying all of that to say that a lot, a, a lot we, we speak of, um, in, um, Elizabeth, you spoke about ecosystem services earlier, but a lot of persons don't really speak about intrinsic value and the rights of things like pollinators, honeybees that I take care of, the intrinsic value, and not just the value to, to society. And I just wanted to make sure that that is actually in the consideration. Um, uh, but going back, going to the ecosystem services portion of it, like um, it is well known that 85% of our foods that we eat today in our agricultural systems are pollinated by bees. It, um, whether it be honeybees that we um, that we that I raise, or the, and a lot of people don't know that there is a stingless bee population in Jamaica that's indigenous to Jamaica. It can be found in nowhere else. Um, I actually had the pleasure of seeing two of those colonies, um, but they can only exist in the forest and be raised in the forest because once you bring them in um, an urban setting, they die from the heat that's there. And that's a part of the challenge. Honeybees are a part of the solution to solve for climate change, but we, we then, um, it's also one of the challenges of beekeeping because um, I, I have to make sure that there's a source of water um, near my bees. So urban areas are a good area for that. So even though the, the, the heat is there, once, once there's a consistent source of water, then they can cool on the hive. Um, but, but the challenge is if we don't put in urban forestry, um, herb, which is one of the reasons why I had I had to move my hives because people just kept on chopping down all of the urban forestry in CV and around. And CV Gardens is known as a beekeeping highway where a lot of swarms come through, right? So um, urban areas like Kingston can do very well for beekeepers like myself, which is why there's an association. And I'm so glad one of my members came on earlier because I actually shared the link with them, right? Um, we, we, it, 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 it provides us with enough shading. I remember having to, um, to do a survey in Kingston and I almost died of a heat stroke if it wasn't for the herb and forestry that saved me. And so, you're, so that, that I'm also pivoting into um, how climate change affects persons who work outside. So I'm talking about the skilled laborers um, and we're going, and I'm here I'm pivoting into the gender aspect. About 70% of our, our, our skilled workers that work outside in the fields are men. Um, and, and then a lot of the vendors who sell bag juice, like my mother downtown, who is a vendor downtown, uh, about a similar percentage of them are women. So, so we, you see how I move from the intrinsic value of biodiversity in agriculture to gender, to, to um, urban forestry. I, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And I think I also I, I think beyond the intrinsic value of, of the bees, and, and a lot of what you spoke about, many times people, I mean, within the space that we're in, I think we all know that no matter how much fertilizer, pesticide, whatever you use, you have to have a pollinator for bearing the 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 fruit, for example, if you want to use that. And a lot of people don't appreciate the importance of pollination. And your intervention is timely, you know, it, you know, just linking issues such as pollination to climate change, and then taking that even a bit further. And this was a comment from Rachel about reduced food security, right? So, I mean, one of the impacts of agriculture and climate change is reduced food security. And that also tie, ties in very well, Adrian, with what you're saying about your bees and pollination and, and urban forests and so on, a lot of which we'll go, we are going to go into on this course. And really, how do we create these urban forests and where do we create them? 
Um, and as I said before earlier, it would be useful if we could come up with a sort of, uh, it's not an index, but a sort of listing of applications within Jamaica, real life applications of these eco EBA approaches that can actually be utilized. So a sort of register. Um, I'm also seeing in the chat, <clears throat> Impacts to crop yield, that's one of the impacts of climate change, where basic crops, there have been reports, and this is from Camille, basic reports from farmers regarding, sorry, report, urge, reports from farmers regarding basic crops like onions. They're either not getting crops because of drought, or the crop is compromised because of flooding. Kerry Ann went on to speak about tourism, the width and integrity of beaches are negatively impacted by rising sea level and damaged coral reef, which is resulting in degraded beaches. And I find personally that now when you go to beaches, even on the North Coast, where 10, 15 years ago, you know, it was just this beautiful white sand beach. Now there seems to be less beach. But in addition to which, we, you have a lot of, um, what do you call it, seaweed, a lot on the beach as compared to before. I mean, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but you also see less beach, less sand, et cetera. And then Chinar was speaking about moving away from traditional forms of farming to more technology-induced agro-business, agro for example, hydroponics. And hydroponics is actually an example of urban farming. So it's something that we would look at as well as we do this course. I'm also seeing oh, there is something with the impacts on climate change, and that is possible. Let me see. If, okay. Um, they seem to all be impacts on agriculture. This is from Donette. Thanks for that. And I will just speak to the impacts. Um, okay. So then, Donette, tell us, what are the impacts on climate change, uh, on tourism, the impacts of climate change on tourism? What are we seeing as some of the impacts? You know, just that was a private message. <laughs> Oh, you no, see, but, but okay, okay, no, 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 I can answer. I, I, because <laughs> I'm looking at the chat, I'm helping people into the room, I'm looking at a presentation, I'm looking at you, so, but no, no problem. But, all right, but in terms of, you mentioned something though, in terms of even the beaches in, when you go to the beaches in Northwood, but I like snorkeling. And so even uh, what I do realize, a lot of the areas where you would see um, a lot of beautiful marine life closer, we're not seeing those anymore. In fact, um, I went on one of those far out glass bottom boat rides and it was extremely disappointing. I was just looking at sun. <laughs> you know, there was oh, two. Yeah, that's there was no I did that one year, a few um, years ago, and I vowed never to do it again because yeah, it's same. it was it is... deceiving because the tour operator, the boat guy, he kept pointing to these dead corals and the tourists were like, wow. And I'm like, no. No. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's so there is that, and um, uh, we mentioned the whole erosion of the beaches and so forth early in the earlier discussion. But those are just the things that come immediately to mind. And I guess you can speak about the spin-off in terms of um the other industries that would be impacted, not necessarily or the other sectors that would be impacted because of the damage or the impact of what is happening with the tourism sector through the climate change issues. Okay, thank you, Donette. Mm -hmm. um, Adrian forgot to say some pests do better in hot temperatures and they may have impacts on um, agricultural crops that, that, that we um, that we want, for example, if you have increased pests. And then, of course, we have the whole issue of mosquitoes and dengue, um, where they actually, I believe, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I think the eggs multiply and rest during the dry season. But the minute you have rain, they all 
they all emerge. And that is why we have increased mosquito-related diseases during periods of heavy rainfall that were preceded by drought conditions. But if I'm wrong on that, correct me. Shamoy, your hand is up. And I see other things in the chat that I will mention after Shamoy. <clears throat> Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so with an expansion in the tourism sector and the extreme weather events, particularly as it relates to um, heat, um, you will have the need for more cooling of these um, buildings, infrastructure. And then, of course, with the use of cooling in terms of AC and so on, you would be using, you would be um, putting out more CO2 in um, the atmosphere. So all of that will be impacting. And of course, you know, we have the nationally determined contribution that we, we um, did, which we are saying that we want to lower CO2 emissions, but with extreme heat and then even more, not just the tourism sector, but more households purchasing um, cooling devices, then you know we're increasing our CO2. So that's um, how and another form of Im impact. Thank you for that. And thanks, Shamoy. And in the chat, I'm also seeing from roads, for example, excess rainfall, storms, et cetera, can lead to diseases which can limit tourism activities, thereby affecting the economic base of the country. Um, anybody else has a hand up? Nobody? Tourism attractions from Camille, are no longer there in many cases. And she mentions Fern Gully is practically gone, for example. Pollution destruction, pollution destruction of the ferns by persons cutting them down, and the temperatures are significantly higher in Fern Gully now. Again, Tamara mentions the impact of food security. And then Rose speaks about pests caused an increase in pests due to these higher temperatures calls for pesticide treatment, which can contaminate surface water. And I think, was it Dan Donnett speaking about the impacts on tourism and how it affects other industries? And we could think of once your tourism sector is impacted negatively. And I think we saw some brilliant examples during COVID. Which sectors become impacted? For example, your, your agricultural sector is impacted. And if agriculture is impacted by climate change as well, we so even though we're attempting to ensure that our agricultural produce, um, that, our agri that our farmers are able to supply the tourism sector, if they're impacted by climate change, they aren't able to supply. So if we take the example of the onions, what would be what what would happen? You would have to import onions to to to, to for, for the tourism sector. So you have tourism, you, you have that linkage between tourism and agriculture, but you also have that linkage between agriculture and the wholesale and retail sector. You also have that linkage between tourism and the wholesale and retail sectors. So you see where climate change can be impacting a myriad of sectors. And what's really not on this slide as well is the impacts on human health from changes in climate. So increasing temperatures, lack of water. So we also know about things like the rotavirus and increasing temperatures leading to the increasing incidence of the rotavirus and gastroenteritis cases. So as we have more increasing temperatures, what could we expect to see in the health sector? We have in Jamaica, for example, an aging population. Um, young persons and older persons are significantly impacted by heat. What does that mean for older persons if we're going to get increased heat? What does that mean for things like heat strokes? What does that mean, for example, even um, just accessing outdoor activities, okay? 
Anybody wants to add anything there? All right, anybody wants to mention any other impacts? We spoke a little bit earlier about the impacts on water resources. Okay. I think earlier this morning. So what I will do now is go on to look a little bit Okay, someone is saying there's also impacts to mental health as a result of changes in climate. Topic five, which is looking at climate change projections. What does the future look like for Jamaica and what are the implications for development? And as I mentioned earlier, I think Arpita has joined us now. I'm gonna pull on Arpita. Is Arpita on, are you on? Yes, I'm here, I just... Okay. Right, um, Dr. Mandal from UE, she, um, lecture, senior lecturer at UE, actually was one of the authors of the State of Jamaica Climate 2019, which was led by Dr. Michael Taylor. So I'm going to throw up a slide, but then I'm also going to be pulling on our Peter to speak about what she, because you know, what, what they saw coming out, um, out of that assessment. What I have here is some very broad information that we all know, frequency, severity of hydrometeorological hazards, um, climate change and variability in combination with other non-climatic drivers such as deforestation and land degradation will affect several other sectors that we rely on or temperatures are getting hotter. Um, the impacts from natural hazards due to climate change will be greater, having significant impacts on our economy, our future developmental prospects, et cetera. Um, so our Peter, um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you and Nadine um, as one of the, I would say for want of a better terminology, supervisors of this project, to chime in at any time. So, Arpito? Hi, yeah, and thanks, Liz. Uh, this project was, as this is Elizabeth Emanuel pointed out, it was led by CSGM, but it looked at the different climate scenarios. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the words uh, RCPs, representative concentrated pathways. So, we looked at all the three different RCPs, that is 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. And we looked on the rainfall, temperature, um, intensity of hurricanes and tropical storms, the projections until 20, end of century, and also the impact on the different sectors. So this is, so my job was to look on the water sector so overall, we saw that the daily temperatures are projected to increase um, in the four zones. So the island was divided into four zones. If you have the report and it's on the draft version of it's online on PIOG's website, but if whenever the final comes up, you will see the island is divided into four zones, east, west, central, and the south, which is pretty much zone uh, south is or the coast which is zone four, then interior zone one and east and west. So overall, we are seeing an increase of uh, mean annual temperature from approximately 1.1 to two degrees change in temperature across all the zones, an average change in temperature. The rain, so we are expecting short, what it is showing is we are expected to get hotter days and hotter nights, the variation between the maximum and minimum that is the day and night temperature is decreasing. So we will get more impact of the heat felt during the day. And we have seen that in the last few years, we have seen that the summers are very hot. And every year we say that this is the hottest summer. 
every year we keep seeing that and we will see that trend, which means the people are more exposed to heat stroke. So that is another impact on the health. Uh, the rainfall is overall, the daily rainfall is showing a decrease, uh, but there is a increase in the short-term heavy intensity rainfall. So the mean rainfall is going to go down, which means you will see longer periods of um, below normal or low rainfall, which will impact our water resources. How? The rivers are going to get dried up. Your recharge will be less. If you are in Kingston and St. Andrew, we have all seen and faced the impacts of low rainfall in 2014, 15, and time to time we get these water lockoffs. So in urban areas with these climate projections of decrease in daily rainfall is going to directly hit our water resources, which will hit the water that is available to us on a day-to-day -day basis because of the limited resources we have. Um, so for the water sector, we looked at two watersheds. Um, we looked at the Rio Kobe watershed and tried to see the flood risk potential and water stream flow indices. So the, um, other sectors were done, but I, I am not going to talk about the other sectors. But um, And also we saw that the annual stream flow for is going to go down with the decrease in rainfall in the major um, our tributaries of the Rio Cobre, which is a bigger watershed than the Kingston watershed and where from where we do tap in water for KMA. Um, there will be an increase in the frequency and intensity of tropical storms and cyclones, which will affect our coastal areas and flooding. So that's in a nutshell what I can say a synopsis of the climate. Um, so it's just a brief synopsis of the of the CS of the report, SOJ report 2019, volume two. Yeah. I guess that's okay. Okay, thanks, Arpito. Any comments on that? Any questions for Arpito? I see two things. Um, <clears throat> Nadine has actually put the link for that State of the Climate Report 2019 in, in the chat. So you can access that report via the link there. And Adrian has indicated in the chat, I remember listening to the news in the early 90s, weather daily temp was between 28 and 30. Now it seems to be between 30 and 33 for Kingston. And more and more, we're seeing these increasing temperatures. So I'm going to ask you quickly, Based on this discussion of the projections presented above, what do you think are the implications for the economic sectors, tourism, agriculture, industry, and on people and infrastructure? But before we begin that discussion, I see Nadine, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to what um, our Peter spoke about, just to give persons a, a general overview of what is in the report. So our Peter spoke to the water sector, but the other sectors that uh, that were looked at in the report include agricultural, coastal resources and human settlements, um, health, uh, tourism and also the economy. And the, the report is a treasure trove of information because it not only looks at the impacts of um, climate change on these various sectors, but it also provides you with climate resources and online tools that you can look at to do your analysis and modeling. So it's a very useful report. So I put the link in the chat, as, as Liz said, so you can look at it and get some useful information. All right. Thanks, Nadine. And thanks for sharing that report. And I encourage you to all um, download it and look at it. But based on the projections and what we know, and I could throw back up that, that, that screen that I had there, um, those, those slides, um, what, what do we think are the implications for or economic sectors, agriculture, tourism, do we see the same implications that we're discussing now? Do we see a more severe situation? 
And I also want to ask if, for example, if based on when we decided on the top five hazards impacting Jamaica, has this discussion changed any opinions of that? Um, Delano, your hand is raised. Right, so good afternoon again. So from a agricultural standpoint, when we look at um, our natural hazards or those things affecting agriculture, we're seeing where it now lead to food insecurity, right? Wherein we're looking to basically import more um, food items and we are expected to produce um, less based on the implications that um, as a result, right, of the climate change. So I am looking into that aspect of it. Okay, for the thanks. food insecurity. Yeah. Thanks, Delano. And um link to that is a comment from Aisha. And I'm gonna ask Aisha to also elaborate on her comment. Declining use in agriculture, the sorrel and bungo peas production last month, which would be I guess December, shows profoundly how negatively climate change is affecting farmers. You want to elaborate a little bit, Anisha? What were those figures? Um, any anything on on that scenario, Anisha? Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Anisha. Well, um, one of the things that we did note is that the farmers, for example, they plan their planting to meet the weather pattern and because of the severe weather conditions last year, especially September, October, one of the issues that a lot of the farmers were having their soil being washed away. And so when it came to Christmas, I am personally still very sad because I have not got soil as yet. And so Bungu peas and soil have been quite popular. Some person had the soil washed away and some plant. I'm not hearing you clearly. Can you repeat that? Just repeat the last one. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I was saying some persons had their soil washed away and others were waiting on the reed to plant, but they never eventually did that because of the changing weather pattern. Okay. Um and we see sometimes we don't see like the full implications of that. So there is some amount of soil production. I think I heard you say that you were not able to access soil. Did you say that? Yes, I did. Right. And so if we're producing less, as you say, if that's really the case, much of that that is produced may end up going into industry. Agree? So for example, you have your true juices that's producing a sorrel drink that's not your traditional kind of home sorrel drink, but a lot of that production would go into that sector. What is actually produced, for example, agree? So you would see, in other words, you sort of take away from the regular man who doesn't want to buy that, or maybe who can't even afford to buy that, the ability to have that Christmas tradition. So we see where climate change not only just has these big tourism and agricultural impacts, but it could also have impacts related to, to, to culture, to, 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 to our countries, you know, your, your, your overarching culture, your heritage value, that kind of thing and certain things that we don't oftentimes reflect on when we think about climate change. Um, someone is agreeing with you, Camille. Well, I can speak on that as well. My brother farms gongo peas based on the weather patterns last year. He won't have a gongo crop until March this year, which from a cultural heritage or point of view, everybody wants it over Christmas. I depend on my gongo piece from him every Christmas and I had none this year. Um, there is a question here, but before I go to that question, Adrian also said increasing drought and temperatures leads to decline in nectar production, 
thereby reducing honey production. And Adrian, just to ask, does it just reduce the production or does it reduce the quality of the honey in terms of its thickness, in terms of its taste, in terms, is it just a decline in production or does it affect other attributes of the honey? Well, for, for, for honey itself, um, it would get thicker um, because there are a lot less water to dilute um, because the bees use it in, di in dilution in the dilution process. Um, but that's usually not the, the challenge with the, the, the customer. Um, the customer has another challenge where it's the other um, bees, um, bee produce that also gets produced. So you're talking about like um, pollen because like, for example, in the Jamaican culture, we know what the, the term strong back, which is that a tonic. We use both the honey and the pollen in that. Um, and so what you, what you find is uh, there's a reduction of flooring which means that there is no pollen, very little nectar, so you can't make some of the cultural the cultural drinks that is known in Jamaica as well. So just, just tacking on to the point of the Gunga peas, it's the same thing for honey. Um, you also get um, reduction in like propolis that you can use to help with gum disease and stuff like that. So a lot of the, a lot of the resources from the hives gets reduced or bees starve and we lose um, the number of producing colonies. So it's, it's, it's not, so, so whilst it doesn't necessarily affect the quality of honey, it's sure, it sure uh, um, affects our production level and the amount of, um, the amount of product. um, products that we can, we, we can, we can produce. The byproducts from the honey and the hives. Yeah, yeah pretty mm -hmm. much. Including the bees themselves because they're also a product. Right. Tamar. Here is a question. Given the projections, impacts of climate change is having and Jamaica's vulnerability of hazards, should we move away from producing food and focus on imports and use these agricultural lands for other purposes that might be more beneficial and less vulnerable to climate change and these hazards? So, Kamar, now you've started a little war here. So let's open up this, um, go to the chat. Should we move away from producing food and focus on imports? But let's look at that within the context of food security. And let us look at that within the context of things like poverty levels. Let us look at that within the context of the amount of persons who depend on their own land for food. Let us look at that in the context of our standard of living, our debt to GDP ratio, what would happen to our foreign exchange rate. So what are your thoughts on that, anybody? And it's a good question, mind you. It, it, it's thought provoking. So if tomorrow your cabinet comes out and says, because of climate change and these projections coming out of the PIOJ, and the climate studies group, we're gonna stop producing food. Oh, Nadine is back. So we're gonna stop producing food and focus on imports. What is your take on that? So this is coming, a question coming from Kemar about moving away because of climate change from producing food. So obliterating or wiping out agriculture and focusing on imports. Anybody? Nobody? Okay, I see Adrian's hand up. Roseanne, Kamar, I don't agree. Our import bill is already so high, yes. And with a high import bill, I mean, there are other impacts on the fiscal side, the fiscal and monetary side of your country. So. If you're increasing your need, you remember for foreign exchange, you're increasing, you're going to have increasing prices. You're going to be locking people out of food. Um, I see several hands up. I will go with Alison, followed by Donette, and then Adrian. So, Alison. And once again, please state the agency you're from. So, like, I never, I don't know where Anisha, well, 
just for everybody, I will ask you just to state where you're from and then Alison, you can go. So, Anisha? Just the agency. Okay, go ahead, Alison, until, go ahead. And okay. State. Thanks, Liz. I, hi, I'm Alison. I'm from the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica. Um, I, I do not agree with the thinking of reducing our agricultural production or stopping our agricultural production. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is, and I think somebody said it, I think it's Tamara who said it, the amount of vulnerability that's going to produce in terms of positioning Jamaica to basically be at the mercy of other countries, it's tremendous. Um, bearing in mind that the impacts of climate change, et cetera, it's not only something that's being experienced in Jamaica, each country is having its own experience. So to put ourselves in a position where, yes, we are still trying to find the best ways to adapt and mitigate, et cetera, to climate change locally, but to also put ourselves at the mercies of other countries that are experiencing similar challenges, I think would be a very, very bad decision on our part. Thanks, Alison, for that. Because then what we'll be doing, Timar, is putting our food security as a country into the hands of others. So as one of the, the key words in Alison's intervention, was adapting. How do we adapt to the changing climate? You know, how do we do things differently to ensure that our agricultural sector is sustainable, is profitable, the livelihoods of farmers are secured, as opposed to moving away from agriculture and focusing on imports. And one of the things with imports as well that is a big thing is that in our agriculture today, even though we are producing, in many cases, we are not, nowadays in several instances, the, the seeds that we plant, many of them that we eat are genetically modified in some way. And for them to actually grow and produce in some cases, they require the use of the fertilizers and so on from the companies that produce the seeds. So we're already in a situation where our food security is in the hands of global corporations, right? That can determine who they sell their product to based on who can afford it. So, you know, have you seen where sometimes where in the past you could plant a tomato seed, dry it and, and you know, start planting it in, in these, you know, like in cotton and stuff, and then transplanting it, in many cases that cannot be done today because we're using genetically modified seeds. So going a step further and saying that we're not gonna have any agriculture because of climate change, maybe to our own detriment. But let me hear from Donette. Um, thanks. I was, well, similar to what you said, and the, I think it was Alison who spoke before. It's, um, it's like adding, or you talk, we'll talk about food security. Look, at, it's putting out something else out there that we're going to be have, we're going to have to be competing and putting our lives in the other, in the hands of someone else. Look at oil prices, for example. So what we're doing, what we'll be implementing, um, doing now is putting food out there where we're depending for somebody else to determine how much, what price, and even if we get it, because then again, it is something that we can use as part of the geopolitical football kind of thing. You notice, for example, if, if you get aid, if you get grant, what you have to do, do we stand as a commu united community in terms of CARICOM on certain policies? Or, you know, do we have to make our own little backdoor deals somewhere else to so, so we can secure ourselves? We, for something like food, I don't think that agriculture, I don't think that is something that we want to put out there and depending solely on imports. Um, the other, the, what I think we should be doing um, and emphasizing a bit more is changing the mindset of some person in terms of what agriculture 
is or what farming entails and the, the, the science behind it, informing our young people, informing even the farmers and the new technologies that are out there. So beefing up the technical capacity of RADA um, to engage with the communities, the farmers, inter because no longer is farming just about a man with a machete and a water boot kind of thing. There's a science behind it. We need to understand what is happening. So I don't think that the, I can understand where the person would have, I don't know who suggested it further up. <laughs> you know, it might be because from an economic point of view, you know, you focus on what you're good at and what you're not so good at and that. But for where it comes to food, I don't think that's where we want to go at all, you know. So that's my two tell cents. Us, tell <laughs> us where you're from, Donnet. Oh, sorry. I'm Donnet Henry from the National Water Commission. Thanks, Donnet. And thanks for that intervention. And I think as we do this course as well, one of the techniques for EBA that we will spend some time on is on um, urban farming and the different types of urban farming. So think about this. I mean, we have a lot of high rises going up in Kingston, um, you know, and we have a lot of young people like yourselves who are going to be buying these apartments. And what about having plots at the top of the, the roofs of these buildings that each person who, who is in an apartment can actually plant something or have a bed, have a raised bed? And that, that is something that is happening in other parts of the world where you, you could have your plot at the roof where you're planting tomatoes, celery, cucumbers, et cetera. So that's also part of the agricultural landscape. And just to add to that, Roseanne's comment is, we also need to look for more sustainable methods of farming and agriculture. We have different things. We can focus on organic farming. How do we make for example, agriculture sexy for young people. And Adrian, we can use you as a poster boy for that because you have a successful, very dynamic um, thing. But at the same time, how do we engage the wider population in agriculture? And what does agriculture mean in the 21st century? Indeed, it's not just the plot of land out there, but there are so many other forms that we could look at and this course also will explore. Let me look at, okay, Dwight, go ahead, Adrian, you're last because you have spoken. I haven't heard from Dwight. Go ahead, Dwight. Thank you, Elizabeth. Dwight, Dwight from Nepal again. Um, so I agree total with what was said earlier by my two former colleagues and what you have said, Elizabeth. But I also want to add that in terms of tree crops now, we can benefit from other um, functions of the trees. For example, in your water cycle, your carbon sequestration, um, in terms of the roots providing, um, helping to prevent erosion. So there are other benefits from farming on the land and planting trees. So in addition to your livelihoods and your food security and all of that, the trees also provide other functions that are beneficial to us as a society. And then if we go back to trees, and I think forestry department may be doing this, but I do have an example from a community in St. Lucia that I've worked with where they were rehabilitating their, their, you know, trying to prevent flooding in their community. And one of the things they did was they planted these trees in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture. But the trees that they planted ended up being a, a whole range of fruit trees. So the entire community does not buy fruit anymore. And then they have surpluses that some of the community actually sells to the markets. So the community development, the CDC, they actually make money for the community to do other projects through that tree planting exercise, which I think in the last couple of years, they, they looked at how the community was impacted by rainfall events and so on the extent of flooding. And of course, they have written reports to show that there has been no flooding since you know these trees have grown up and so on. So again, I think I saw somewhere where forestry is actually giving out or selling fruit trees. So that may be something that we're doing as well. Um, Shamoy, just before we go to you, Adrian, she says, no, we should not do um, give up on agriculture. 
because it makes us vulnerable, as can be seen with what happened with oil and the Ukraine-Russian war. But it wasn't just oil, it's several things that has happened because of that Ukraine-Russian war. Um, there, tomorrow, there will be a huge disparity in who eats, who can afford to eat, and who eats what. Rose says, I think it's even more crucial that we continue to produce our own food. Imports are a no-no. Issues of vulnerability will be more pronounced. That's Tamara. Camille says, speaks about displacing several groups. What we need to be doing is encouraging every person to be more self-sufficient. And I think this is one of the things that will come out in this course as well. Utilize areas for urban farming, encourage better design strategies, which can respond to the climate issues directly. Tasha Gay, the reality of climate change is not unique to Jamaica. Therefore, I do think the agricultural sector should explore different methods of adapting to the change in climate. And Roseanne Smith, I am, dri I am driving. Oh, but we have to also think about the number of people who are dependent on agriculture as a livelihood. And that is important because you do have countries where the contribution to agriculture and fisheries is very small, yet they continue, governments continue to support that sector because of the, 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 the cultural heritage and, and so on of particular communities. That's who those communities are. That's how those communities are identified, et cetera. And then Shamoy, we instead need to look at planting heat resistant crops that can adapt to the heat, look at different varieties of crops, ramp up technological research. Um, okay, so I will now go to Roseanne and Adrian because we haven't heard from Roseanne for the whole morning except in the chat. So Roseanne. Hi, Elizabeth. You know, I'm just walking into my house out of the vehicle. Um, I'm Roseanne Smith, lecturer at the Department of Geography and Geology at UWE. And I really want, I was chatting a lot in the chat, but I wanted to raise the whole point of um, climate change adaptation and some of the things that we have to look at in terms of who can adapt in relation to what was said about agriculture. Because a lot of the fact, the, um, a lot of the times, the persons like the farmers and so on, they are only dependent on agriculture. It's their only way of making a living. But at the same time, the income is small and they are already struggling to adapt to climate change. Now you're going to take away their entire livelihood. That is their only form of a salary. Also, it's their only form of eating. To remove agriculture is to push a good amount of persons below the social protection floor. And so if you're speaking about climate change adaptation, you can't take out agriculture out of the picture. You also have to think about the importance of the trees themselves. And I know I mentioned it in the chat and I heard, I think somebody from Nepal saying it. Recently I was with Jawik and one of the things that they were promoting and Jawik is Jamaica woman in coffee is organic farming and how these small farmers can set up their farms so that they, um, they, they are farming more sustainably, using a lot of the fruit trees around and having this, I think six, seven layers, so that and um, using back a lot, like a lot of the leaves and it promotes that carbon sequestration and all these different things. So I think the move is not, should not be away from agriculture, but how we are currently doing agriculture. And we have to recognize at the end of the day, we cannot do it in a vacuum because a lot of our people who we can't find jobs for otherwise are heavily dependent on agriculture as a form of livelihood, right? So you're telling them at some point in time to, to um, do these things to prepare for a hurricane and they can't buy a light bulb. And then you're going to take away that very same livelihood that is important for them to be able to purchase a light bulb, to purchase hurricane shutters, to purchase certain things. So we can look at it too narrowly. And I know the person speak about using the land for something else. And I'm wondering for what, you know, because if we are saying using it for what, what comes to my mind is developers, they will rush in. And then you're going to turn um, agricultural land into concrete. And so we are going to have that same, all the climate change 
issues perpetuating. So it's really something that, you know, I really cannot agree with in terms of our move from agriculture, in addition to all of the other points that were raised. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. And Kamar, let me thank you for your question because it has raised a lot of discussion. So continue to be that advocate in the other three. Think outside that box and everybody will respond and we'll get everybody speaking. So that was great. So even though they're beating up on you, um, it's a good question. Um, Adrian, I'm coming to you, but I'm seeing other things in the chat. 29 new messages. Um, with the increase in temperature rise, this is coming from NWC. Twen I don't know who, this, who you are, I can't remember your name. On the work sector for those individuals who have to work outdoors and a negative impact on their health, this will have a negative impact on productivity. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Um, tomorrow, issues of vulnerabil vulnerability will be more pronounced, that is true. Camille, we will display several groups. What we need to do is encouraging every person, I think I read this one, to be more self-sufficient, encourage better design strategies. Um, Sasha is saying, I do not think the agricultural sector, I do think the agricultural sector should explore different methods. Um, Shamoy with the heat resistant crops. Um, Roseanne made a point that she didn't elaborate when she spoke, but she said, we also have to think about health. A lot of food is filled with chemicals. And we do have countries, you know, where in the Caribbean, 90% of the food consumed in the Bahamas, they're not short of food, the Bahamas. And of course, you know, they have one of the highest um, per capita GDPs in the Caribbean. I mean, around 28,000 US dollars, right, per annum. They're not short of food. They import 90% of their food because unlike Jamaica, they do have a lot of poor soils that cannot really support traditional agriculture. But they are significantly impacted with non-communicable diseases because a lot of the foods that they import and consume are high in salt, high in sugars, they're processed. So they have a very high rate of overweight and obese adults and children, and they're seeing an increase in the incidence of non-communicable non diseases at much younger ages. And one of the issues we have in Jamaica, for example, is that people in their 40s and 50s who contract these non-communicable diseases end up by the time you're 70, 75, losing your eyesight, losing a limb, etc. And many persons, we hear sometimes that the hospitals are filled, but a study done by the University of the West Indies actually showed that those hospitals are filled with persons who may have had, who have non-communicable diseases and whose families will not take them back home because they're not able to care for them in the way that they should. So, I mean, there are a number of issues that we can talk about around agriculture, the impacts of climate change, and how we deal with those impacts of climate change on the sector. Adrian. Yeah, I just wanted to tap in in terms of, um, for, let, let's go from a beekeeping perspective, since that's where most of my thing is from. The, we need to consider, if we discontinue agriculture, the biosecurity. So if you look at honey as a product, if Jamaica now prohibits the importation of honey, if we then allowed for honey to be imported, you could see an increased incidence of American fowl brood disease that almost decimated the apiculture industry, which um, at the time during 2005 to 2008 accounted for some 12 billion Jamaican dollars each year in the, in, in the Jamaican economy. So if it, um if if if, the, if that can be a, a result of one small sector like beekeeping imagine what would happen if you had like the the the, the slug fungus that um 
affects the banana industry? What about the sugarcane industry that's already dying? What about the orange industry? I think the orange industry was um, in Florida is being affected by the greening disease, right? So just from a biosecurity standpoint, um, you could decimate the income of smallholder farmers. Um, I pivot to another piece of statistics. Okay, so uh, is it directly related or can I go on? It is kind of directly related in terms of um, we can just just to, just to quickly say that we can survive off about six percent. The globe, it all eight billion of us can survive off, off about six percent of what we're planting on the planet now. So just imagine if Jamaica was that what that six percent, right? So I'll, I'll just kind of close there and say yeah, um, we need to continue. Yeah, and the other thing with your bees as well is that, you know, I guess everyone knows it's illegal to bring in honey into Jamaica because of the issues. Even a little tub of honey is illegal to bring in, so don't. Okay, so we see from Tamara from forestry, there has been a push for agroforestry by the forestry department to aid with sustainable livelihood adaptation in forest dependent communities. There was a recent similarity with a lack of oxygen in the heights of the COVID pandemic. We need to produce our own food where possible. That was from David. Camille recognizes as well that the issues with climate change in our agricultural production is the same worldwide. In 2011, I participated in a screening of the documentary, Climate Refugees. This was shown in that all countries worldwide are experiencing shortages of food due to climate change. What Jamaica needs to be doing is trying to become more resilient and trying to mitigate against the climate change issues. Eliminating agriculture because of climate change shock stresses makes Jamaica more economically volatile to global shocks from price increases as well as shocks from international trade and supply network networks, even greater so amplified during a natural man-made disaster. Such a policy position is a backward step why not use our limitations in agriculture to focus on niche markets, example, export of Jamaican agricultural produce and byproducts to the Cayman Islands or the islands of the greater Antillian countries. And Jamaica does have unique products, like for example, as you mentioned, niche markets. One of the big niche markets that we could develop is sea cucumbers, which has supposedly is in demand in countries like China, and Jamaica has a good quality sea cucumber. Um, so that's something that, I mean, there are several products in the niche market that we could look at. Um, a good point here by Kimberly is that if we are having problems in Jamaica producing food, wouldn't that mean that other countries have the same problem as well? And when this becomes a serious issue globally, countries would look to feed their own citizens first and may even eventually stop exporting. And then Roseanne, when, we're go when we remove the, the land, are we going to be removing the trees for developers? Then we'll be removing the natural carbon seque sequestration. And Roseanne did like your point about the social protection flaws. We need to explore permaculture, regenerative agriculture. This is from Evelyn, conserving our soil as we farm, allowing the soil microbiomes to restore soil. All right, so we've had several, Roseanne speaking here, not Rose, Rose, sorry, speaking about strategies, educating, assisting our farmers, modern technologies, and the whole focus on more attention being placed to climate smart agricultural practices. And then Alison speaks about these amazing vertical agricultural design structures that can be easily placed on balconies and patios, et cetera. Yet, and that is also part of EBA, Donet, saying that she saw something similar in South Korea a few years ago in rooftop gardens. I don't know if it's because I'm working on this project. I have a whole lot of things on South Korea coming in my social medias on rooftop gardenings and so on. And I've seen some very interesting things that I'll share throughout this course as well. Regenerative agriculture, 
And Donette says, maybe Kamar was being devil's advocate, but we'll ask him to continue with that um, going forward. Um, and Adrian, plus not producing food is deflecting associated environmental degradation to other places like Brazil that will deforest the Amazon more. And we're seeing the impacts of deforestation on Amazon on the Amazon in other areas and the link with sargassum, for example. So, I mean, this, of course, we see why climate change is such a topical issue because we have seen several responses coming out here from this discussion. <clears throat> and keep all of these things in mind because as we, as you go into, as we get into the depth starting next week of EBA, and we start to look at the techniques and so on, we're gonna to have to link that back to particular industries, to particular sites in Jamaica, because at the end of the day, we want to make the course as practical as possible and where real life examples could be deployed and implemented through projects and programs being undertaken by your public sector, for example, within communities, and not leaving out the private sectors, you do your EIAs and so on, and you provide recommendations. These would, th we would be things that maybe you can even consider recommending or your architects and engineers. How do you do designs that incorporate these EBA solutions and how, and you know, and even be, being able to provide examples. <clears throat> so we're looking a little bit now at, urban and peri-urban issues and challenges facing Jamaica. But first and foremost, let, let's just say, I mean, 26% of our population, the population of Kingston, St. Andrew and Portmore is about 765,000 people or 26% of Jamaica's population. About 52% or more than, a little more than half of Jamaica's population lives in urban areas. So we have increasing urbanization. This has coupled over the years with low levels of urban planning. And go ahead. It puts urban planning and peri-urban areas at risk from the increasing frequency and intensity of these natural hazards. Any disagreement, anything you want to add here? So we're saying that about a quarter of our population lives in the capital city. And if I go on to show a sort of rough profile of our urban centers and, and just, just a profile, and we're using in terms of urban and other urban centers, we're saying we're looking at things like poverty. Much of this data is coming from the social and the economic survey for Jamaica. 2020. So what I'm saying here is that this table before you, it really shows a profile of the KMA and Jamaica's other urban centers, many of which can be assumed to form what we can refer to as the immediate urban rural interface in Jamaica, the other urban centers. Um, so we look at poverty, and in our other urban centers or, or some of our peri-urban areas, we're looking at 12% in 2018, 13.4% in 2019, even though in the KMA, we're seeing a significant reduction in poverty. And in Jamaica in general, we're seeing a poverty rate of 11% in 2019 compared to what we say our other urban sort of peri-urban areas look like. In terms of food poverty, we're seen in 2019. And if you look at those other urban centers, which we are seeing can, can be assumed to form the immediate urban rural interface in Jamaica, which is kind of like where your peri-urban peri spaces lie, we're seeing where food poverty in 2019, for example, in those spaces was about 6.5% compared to Jamaica, which was 4%. Um, Lower levels of safe and affordable drinking water, access to lower levels of access to improved sanitation and so on. And I didn't have the figures for housing quality index, but um, okay. 
So when we talk about urban and peri-urban landscape in Jamaica, um, what we're seeing in many cases, and I know there has been good attempts to improve the planning landscape. A lot of what NEPA has been doing in the recent last recent years with your with spatial planning and the development of what are those plans called? They're not called spatial plans. Your development orders? Yes. Your thanks, Alison. Your or Donet. The development orders um, has really contributed to reducing some of the challenges we were experiencing or have been experiencing over the years. So we still have channel challenges of things like urban sprawl, unbalanced regional development, um, limited availability of affordable housing, but we're seeing across the board attempts to change that. We still have squatting, informal settlements, inequality. I mean, even though we say that poverty levels have reduced from say 18% a few years ago to 11%, we still do have poverty. And what is critical is that it's not poverty, but it's vulnerability. So how many of those in Jamaica we're known to have what is referred to as the working poor? Because having a job in Jamaica doesn't guarantee you um, not being vulnerable, for example. And when I think about poverty, I like to think about the people who live just above the poverty line. And I, I use the example of, you know, those black birds that you see on top of the high tension wires. Everybody know what they're talking about? Yep. You see, them, you see them a lot in the US, but you see them here too. And they're all on that wire, right? And they're all lined up. So I like to look at that as the people sitting just above the poverty line. So they're sitting on the line. And when you have a strong wind blow, which is a shock, any type of shock. What happens to those birds? They drop off the line, right? And that, so, so saying that we have 11% poverty, we also need to focus on how much of that other 89% of our population is vulnerable to shocks. So it's not good enough for, for us to say, oh, we only have 11% poverty, that's great. But what is the extent of vulnerability and how is a climate shock going to affect the other 89% of our population? What percentage it can be impacted by a shock? Is it just 1% or is it even more than 11%? It's, is it 40%? Is it 20%? So how many more are vulnerable? What is the extent of inequality? All right, we are known in Jamaica to have high levels of inequality where figures have shown over the years that the wealthiest in the population earn, they did, I think it's what, 10% of the population or 5% of the population earns 80% of the wealth of the country, right? So that alone speaks to inequality. Inequality, you also can see inequality on the surface in terms of things like per capita income. So when we talk about a Bahamas that has a per capita income of 28,000 US dollars or a Barbados of 18,000 US dollars or a Trinidad of 23,000 US dollars, that means on average, every Bayesian earns 17,000 US dollars per annum. Jamaica's per capita, I think is probably around 6,000 something or $7,000. So when you look at that and all you have to do is take a ride in Jamaica and you see every other car is a BMW and Audi or so on. That alone will speak to, that alone can be a picture of what inequality looks like. So you're not seeing one BMW here and one in Mobe. You're seeing more and less, like you would say, less Nissans or something. We have congested towns. We spoke this morning about vehicular traffic and parking lots and cars and more people driving. And of course, we're seeing what urban sprawl is doing. We're seeing what these concrete jungles are doing. I will not open another can of worms about Devon House, but that could be another one as well. Um, 
and climate change presents a significant challenge for urban systems. We're talking about our water and wastewater systems. We're talking about infrastructure, among others. Like I know, for example, that Barbados recently launched this study looking at its gullies and it, the, the absorptive capacity of its gullies within the context of a change in climate. What does it need to change? What does it need to do, right? 